Hello, everyone in the internet. <laughs> Thank you all for coming tonight. What a beautiful turnout. I wish you could be there in person to shimmy up on you all, but this feels almost as good. <laughs> Just like that. <laughs> It's all too delicious. Um, we were in the chat and um, we'll say it again up here, but we are so honored to have each and every one of you present with us digitally, um, whether you're screening this now or screening it later. The support of this project and this conversation means so much to us. We have literal family, chosen family, so much representation from people that we love so much. and. A big welcome to anyone who is new to us, this book, or any of this work. Um, you are all family now. And um, I think we're going to start with a presentation from Naima. So we'll hand it over to Naima and we'll see you guys in just a bit. All right. Hi, everyone. Bear with me for a second. Okay. Hi, my name is Naima Green. Um, I'm so grateful to be here. Thank you, Jenna and Kimberly for this gorgeous book and also for having me here tonight. I'm gonna start um, with my newest work that is a public work and it's called In Full of Dreams Too. And it sits at the George Floyd Memorial site in Minneapolis, Minnesota. This work was really, really difficult for me to do. Um, when I was first asked, I said no, because I didn't know where to start. I felt like um, Black bodies, especially this year, have already been through so much. And I knew that I didn't want a portrait um, to have to do more work at this site of so much grief and so much trauma. Um, and so I really started to think about my practice more broadly, which I am interested in investigating kind of green spaces, but especially bl black and brown bodies in urban green spaces um, and thinking about sites of leisure and refuge and places where we can rest and places where we can feel at ease because it is so hard for black people um, to do that on the day to day. And so, and Full of Dreams too became a sort of altar and representation of an opening of a way to think about the imagination of a way to kind of create a space and a pause to breathe, um, to, to kind of rest a little bit in this, in this site. This is Michelle Lisa um, from my long-term series, Jewels from the Hinterland. And I'm sharing this picture tonight because it, when I first saw it, when I first got this film developed, I thought it was a mistake. It, it's a mechanical glitch. The double exposure was not intended at the time, um, but this picture represents so much more. And I think that glitches um, allow, this glitch in particular allowed me to kind of rethink my work anew. Um, and it was a necessary disruption in my own ways of seeing and in my own ways of thinking about what a portrait could be, um, what the body was gonna be asked to do and how the layering of the green space becomes a part of the person. For those who are in New York, um, Reese Beach is a site of joy and love and pleasure. Um, and Reese is a, a site that I have been visiting over many, many years and making pictures over many, many years. Um, integral to my practice is care and community. And so this picture represents a lot for me. It was a, a late September day and Jenna texted me in the morning and said, I'm going to the beach, are you coming? And I said, I'm, I'll be there. I don't know who's going to be there, but let's just go. I'll find you when I get there. And when I went, I, I thought it would just be me and Jenna. And Jenna was like, oh, I'm bringing a friend. And by the end of a couple of hours, there were probably 20 of us spilling out um, around each other. And I think that this Reese in particular is such a special place because it is a place where 
black and brown queer bodies are, are really free and uncensored and in all of my experiences there. Um, and thinking about, I think I moved a lot in my work from thinking about how I, thinking about care um, as something that could be contained. And now I think about it in a way of care is really allowing for the, the slippage and the spillage and allowing to people, allowing for people to kind of be more nuanced and more messy and kind of extend beyond what the portrait might offer. This is a portrait of Troy earlier this year, socially distanced. One of the largest um, works that I've embarked on is a project called Pursuit. And Pursuit began in 2018. Um, it currently lives as a deck of playing cards. It's a forthcoming kind of emergent archive prototype that I'm working on right now, but the deck of cards and the origins of the project stem from Catherine Opie's Dyke deck. And that was a project that came out in 1994, 1995. And when I saw that deck, it was made on, on the West Coast in the Bay Area. When I saw that deck, I really was thinking about what would it look like for my community, for the people that I love, for the people that I don't know, but um, this was also my first time doing an open call. So I invited people that I did not know into this work, but inviting people in New York in 2018 and 2019 into this project, thinking about queer life, thinking about queer love, thinking about friendship and partnership of all kinds. So I invited um, individuals, collectives and couples to sit for this project and sit for this work. Over nine days in Brooklyn, I photographed over 105 people um, and it became this deck. And it was really a, a true, true team community effort designed by Ren Kim and Caroline Washington. Um, but it wouldn't have happened with everyone who, without everyone who, who sat for this work. And so the deck began as an object, like a very simple object that I was thinking about, okay, what is something that is both that could be, that is a mundane object, that it is something that you can get at a bodega, but that it holds so much power in its everydayness and the way that we can transform this very simple thing that you might see in more places than you know, um, but have faces of queer community so that you might feel seen when you look at this deck. And the deck is currently uh, framed as a single object right now at Photographiska and that exhibition is called Brief and Drenching, um, is up until February 28th. When I first made the deck, I really thought about it. Um, Jenna and Kimberly, we were talking on, on Friday night and they talked about the book as a companion. And I think about pursuit in that way. It's something that you can keep in your pocket. It's something that you can play solitaire with. It's something that you can play spades with. Um, but then it also holds, it's also an art object. And so seeing the deck frame, seeing all the cards laid out together really creates an, an additional layer for me when thinking about this work and thinking about regard and thinking about care and thinking about um, respect also and honoring the people in the project. So I'm gonna share just a couple installation shots. Um, so a deck of playing cards, as most of you know, are, are two and a half by three and a half inches. It's a very small object. And so in the exhibition, there are 11 portraits from the deck that are about 30 by 40 inches. So really taking up a lot of space within the gallery walls, within the museum, um, you're walking into that space and you can't look away from these people. And so I think it's really important to play with scale for me and my work and thinking about how can I both step back and look at this large portrait of this couple? How can I also force people or encourage people to step into the work because the deck is so small to look at the design, to look at those details? Here's another view. And most of the people in pursuit um, are from New York, are based in New York. And a lot of them are in Brooklyn as well. So I'm gonna talk about two more pieces quickly. Um, 
on the right is my first attempt at uh, furniture design. So this is a, a piece, this is a birthing stool that I made with my collaborator, Ivan Ontiveros in Mexico City. Um, and this is a portrait of Cynthia and Travis right here. So I met Cynthia and Travis, we moved to Mexico City around the same time um, in late 2018, early 2019. And I made this portrait with them about three weeks before their son Tinoch was born. And right now, especially in this time, I'm thinking so much about touch and the lack of touch. I'm thinking about being on the verge of so many things. I personally feel like I'm on the verge of bursting or crying at any moment, especially in these past couple of weeks. Um, and so thinking about the tenderness in that embrace and really focusing on the touch of their hands and how much can be communicated in that gesture. And then thinking about the process of making slowly. I, I moved to Mexico City with no experience in carpentry, made this birthing stool over the course of six very slow months um, with Yvonne. And it was really a process. I'm showing you some of the documentation around the final object because it feels so important to the final piece. I think that the, the process informs so much of how I imagine my work and see my work in the world. So I'm gonna end there and I'll talk to you soon. Naima, thank you so much for that beautiful presentation. Oh man, there's a lot to talk about, but before we get too far ahead of ourselves, I realized that I think it might be good just to, as a framing device, talk about a little bit of why we're here and how we found ourselves in this event along with these two titan humans. Um, so Jenna and I have been working on this incredible book project called Black Futures, which is now in the world, which is so terribly exciting. Um, many of you may have bought the book through your ticket purchase for this event or through some other venue, um, but we are so, so thankful to each and every one of you that has supported this project that was really interested in being a catalog, a tome, a holding space for so many projects related to Black culture in this present moment, in the future, and in the past. Um, we can get more into kind of dialogue around it, but I just wanted to give that as a framing device because I think sometimes, especially in this digital world, we just kind of hop in and there's like all these assumptions made about how things are going. And so I just wanted to put that out there that we are here and talking about this project of which um, we are both so lucky, Jenna and I are so lucky to have Naima and Raquel within these pages of. Um, and as you can see, or maybe you're getting notifications, we're both very active in the chat. So if there's any questions that come up specifically about the book, um, please launch them into the Q&A or into the chat um, because the book is, as you can see, she's thick, there's a lot going on. And um, I think for us in this event, we just wanted to seize the opportunity to talk to two of our favorite humans. And that's what we're gonna do. That's what you're here for. Um, but if you have specific questions about the book, we're also very happy to answer those. Um, but this is our show and not yours. And so um, we're gonna do what we wanna do. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to say that. And then I'm gonna hand it off to my brilliant co-editor, Jenna, uh, to dive into <laughs> our conversation. <laughs> It's also everyone's show. You're so funny. My Leo baby can't help herself, but it's, it's, you know, the book is real thick, real juicy because we have so many people in it. And Naima, thank you again for talking more about your practice, especially because your contribution to the book does not encapsulate the full body of everything that you're working on. And so it's really incredible to get that overview and background of all the things you've been working on as, as you know, your craft has been evolving. Um, I wanted to draw in our sibling, our sister, our sister friend Raquel out here with this purple Pat McGrath palette on her face. And I wanted to kick things off and, and bring you in because you and Naima's work does this quite a bit. And I wanted to talk to you about your contribution for Black Features because when I reached out, I don't even remember when, 
and just asked you, you know, if you had something in mind that might work with the social media spreads. I'm gonna hold up yours right here in the book. Um, we asked several contributors to create these social media spreads. So documenting a really transformative or incredible moment in social media. So much of the Black Futures Project is really invested in archiving and really resisting the ephemerality of social media because so much of, of our, our creativity and entrepreneurship and dialogical interactions are happening on these hashtags that aren't really being preserved in a sustainable way. And so what would it mean to ask some of our preeminent scholars and thinkers and creators about the movements that really inspired them and, and to archive them in the book? And so I wanted to ask Raquel a bit, you know, to talk a bit about what you chose and why. Yeah, thank you so much for that warm introduction. And of course, thank you, Naima, for starting us off with all of that brilliance that you always bring. Um, yeah, you know, it's it's interesting. So Jenna, we met, I think it was the first time we met when after the like two weeks together, maybe we were at a writing residency for Jack Jones Literary Arts. Um, you requested um, that I uh, write something about this. Um, so right off the bat, Jenna had me working, honey. That, that's all I'm gonna say about our friendship. But no, I'm just kidding. But um, honestly, you know, me too. Go on. <laughs> right. But you know, it was um, it was such an honor, right? First of all, because Jenna was the writer in residence for uh, for that residency. So that was that was powerful, just to kind of be on a fly on the wall to um, your brilliance, but. I also was just honored to be able to capture um, some of the early, um, I, I can't even really say early digital presence of the trans community, but I think particularly on social media, a time when we were really rising in prominence. Um, so thinking about these hashtags, trans is beautiful and how Laverne Cox has utilized that to raise an awareness um, and empowerment of Black trans folks and, and just our right to be fucking beautiful and amazing. Um, and Janet's uh, hashtag, Janet Mock's hashtag, um, girls like us, and, and what that meant in terms of raising awareness, particularly around the experiences of trans women of color. And so, you know, I think social media is so powerful because it has been this democratizing force in a lot of ways in terms of getting folks on the margins, the um, megaphones that we always deserve. And so you can see tweets go viral about what once were, was considered very niche experiences of humanity. And I think what we've learned um, through trans people using social media more and more for different things is that we aren't niche, right? That we actually have a very powerful perspective that everyone can be tapped into in terms of eschewing um, these boxes that we're all kind of forced to live in that don't really fit us. I could go on. I just. I was just gonna say, I was like, Jen and I are like, oh, jump in, jump in. Jump in. <laughs> I think it's incredible. I mean, I'm, I'm, I was not in the asking, but I am, of course, in the receiving <laughs> of your incredible work on this essay, which happened in multiple iterations. Um, I think for us, and Jenna might kill me for telling the story, but we had a lot of internal battles about how to really adequately speak to conversations around visibility um, and think about how to hold both the brilliance and abundance, like you were talking about those connective tissues and thinking about the many, many impressions that have happened in terms of how we're finding ourselves online. And then also the negative sides of it and the negative connotations of it. And throughout Black Futures, there are many instances where there are simply photos of Black trans people. There are essays by Black trans people. There is your essay, which is explicitly about a Black trans experience. And through our editing together, we were trying to think about ways to um, both honor and privilege that storytelling, and then also, you know, do our best as editors to make sure that there was enough room for all those things to coexist. Because I think sometimes we find ourselves, especially I think more broadly, as Black people, and to quote you directly, like thinking about Blackness as this kind of queer 
exi queered existence or, you know, intentionally queered by the world around us existence, um, how explicit do we have to be in our storytelling and, and what does that look like? And are we selling ourselves short by trying to paint perhaps overly joyful stories of ourselves? What does it mean to create volumes that show us living um, fully and vibrantly? Um, but at any rate, I just wanted to first say thank you so much for this offering in its many iterations and its many shapes and forms, um, because I think it really does help us to wrap our arms around, especially from the, the standpoint of social media, which was really central and I think is really central in this moment, obviously, for so many of us, um, to just start to grapple with some of that as part of this, this book. Yeah, I mean, even in the writing of it, I will say, I think the initial drafts, um, even as I came back to it, I was like, oh, wow, I really felt so differently, I think, about visibility and what that meant. Um, and the inherent, this kind of idea of an inherent benevolence to that experience. Um, and then in some of the later drafts, I was like, actually, this is I need to complicate this a little bit more. And I think we're all kind of experiencing a lot of that right now, right? The visibility is, is not enough just as is, right? It can be both um, beneficial for a group of folks on the margins and it can be devastating. You know, I think about recently what happened to Laverne Cox. If you haven't been following, but on social media, she shared a um, IG Live about how she essentially was attacked by this um, ostensibly cis guy in um, a park with a friend. And, you know, I think that that is, she is probably the figure that can most kind of elucidate the fact that visibility isn't always a beautiful thing. And she talks about how it actually can make you more of a target. And I think that that is so true. Um, I also think about these conversations around representation. You know, we say all day long, honey, whatever group we can think of, we need more representation of it. But obviously we have very flawed examples of representation for any group you can think of. I think about the Supreme Court. If you want more women in political office or, or in these judicial seats, honey, the deplorable ACB is not the kind of representation I want to see, even if she is a woman, right? Um, when I think about um, a lot of these Black comedians, Kevin Hart was just trending recently. I think about Dave Chappelle, you know, men who have been successful have created work that has touched so many folks and have also um, been devastating to particularly Black women and LGBTQ plus folks, right? So, I think we do have to have more complicated conversations on visibility and representation. Um, and then I guess another example, right, is the recent kind of conversation around um, the selection, right? And, and how we now have Kamala Harris, what does that mean, right? And I know even in the book, folks have talked about Obama and, and what did that mean, right? What were the shining points of that representation and some of the difficult points as well. Yeah, I really appreciate that. And I think that that's something that's come up, you know, with Kimberly and I too, as we worked on this book, you know, what's in the book, what's not in the book. And, you know, even as all of us continue to navigate how we and what we share about our lives and our personal lives and our careers, and especially in this moment of going through the pandemic when our lives are really compressed onto a screen, you know, it can feel like our only outlet in so many ways for, for promotion. And I think something I'm really curious to hear about from everybody, including Kimberly, my co-editor, is, you know, how are we all grappling with the ways in which visibility can be this kind of double-edged sword in the way, I mean, Kimberly always says so brilliantly, it's come up so many times in our, um, these last couple of weeks as we've been chatting about, you know, diversity and inclusion as being kind of you know, like a steel trap essentially because it's 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 predicated on this idea of a quota and the, a quota will never be enough to to rectify the reason that those types of initiatives come about in the first place and and fuck a quota like that's not the that's not it you know that's not that's not inherently fixing anything that's structurally flawed it's it's operating from the assumption that we'll always be left of center in the margins and you know what does it mean to move ourselves back towards that center but I am curious to hear too about how you're thinking about 
you know, towing that line, um, since so much of all of our work does does kind of revolve around that idea of visib visibility and what it means to push for that representation. Whoever wants to go first, I can call on someone or you can volunteer. I can start. Um, I Yeah, I definitely feel the double-edged sword nature because it feels like I'm personally just a very private person. So I don't like my life to be on display in a, in a certain way, but it also feels like in these moments, I feel like vulnerability is so critical in trying to just support each other in this moment and in this time. And so I find myself sharing more about the difficulties that I've had this year um, than I probably would have ever done publicly before and also feeling so okay with that because we're all going through and holding so much. And so it feels there, it just feels nice to, to kind of offer a little bit more of what of what's happening behind the scenes. And I think also as a photographer, I'm very invested in beauty and creating objects and photographs and things that are just beautiful and that you want to look at. But there's also so much more behind that and behind the process. And so I don't want to kind of shadow real life with beauty, but it's like a way, an entry point, but not kind of the ending point is kind of how I'm thinking about it right now. Come on, Raquel. <laughs> um, yeah, sorry, could you ask this one more time? Of course. I up in Naima's response. And then I was thinking about this year and then I was like, oh, okay. Go yeah, ahead. Please. I got you, boo. I think um, your response to Kimberly's question about the ways in which, you know, bringing up the Laverne Cox example and, and talking about the ways in which visibility can topple over, you know, it can become, it, it can be this double-edged sword and it can be a really tough line to walk. Um, especially as we push for representation, but there are limits to it, you know what I mean? Um, and that once a certain degree of it happens, it feels like I get out of, you know, like you're off the hook easy. Well, we did that. We have this thing that speaks to this experience when the truth is it's usually never enough. But I think I'm wondering how, how do we all tow that line personally, especially because so much of our own politic and the organizing principle around our work involves to some degree pushing for visibility and representation? Yeah, um, I, you know, I, I think that um, it's hard to, to answer that question. I mean, this is like, oh, I think a lot of this like cultural work is speculative fiction, even if it's not necessarily called that because we are creating things in the service of a future where we are, we do have some kind of fullness of representation. But I don't I don't know that that is possible. I, and I, I'm thinking, Jenna, about your conversation with um, I believe it was uh, Tana Hasty Coates um, about uh, how we have to fight, even though we know we won't see the things that we, we're fighting for in our lifetimes, right? Um, I think that that is true across the board, you know, especially in this fight for representation. Um, but I, I think it's also that we are so dynamic and all constantly evolving that the representation that I needed at five years old maybe is maybe not the same representation I need now, you know, a damn near 30, right? Um, because I didn't have the same kind of perspective. I hadn't had all of these experiences. I didn't have the language and the tools to um, think about my experience. Um, and then I think the other side of that too is being open to the idea that um, what you will need, what you will, what will make you feel full is not gonna be the same in the future, God willing. So if I continue to learn and grow and evolve, you know, what I need to sustain me will probably be different. And I have to be open to 
the fact that um, all of this is kind of limitless. Um, even, even when I think about um, Black trans representation, I mean, for me, that can mean so many things. But I, I know that it's not necessarily, the fight isn't necessarily for me to feel seen. It's for folks, for other folks um, to also have a, a feeling of being seen. I'm not um, considered disabled. So what does it mean for there to be representation for a Black trans woman who is disabled or a Black trans person who is disabled? That probably won't be exactly the same for me, right? Similarly, if you bring in class, all of these different kind of intersections. So I'm okay with the, the limits of my mind, the limits of my imagination, um, just not simply being enough. And I think having humility around that is key so that we can keep striving and creating in the service of folks we may not know who they are, what they call themselves, who they love, how they want to express themselves, but but the door will be open. Um, and I hope that makes sense. I mean, I think all of this is so messy, um, but it's beautiful that we even have space now to talk about these things. I think about previous generations, a lot of folks didn't really have the space. I think about folks who, you know, were enslaved, right? What, where was the space to think about expression in the ways that we think about it now? And I think also we're thinking about it in such a more nuanced way that allows for more dynamic representations, which I think even in my growing up, I feel like I'm seeing so much more nuanced, complex ways of picturing and seeing and understanding the world more generally. And I also, Raquel, I don't know if I answered the question right, so that's probably why you got confused. <laughs> um, I love both of your answers um, for scale. And Raquel, I'm sorry to put you on the spot. I think I was just reading um, the comments and I just wanted to also say that we're gonna keep talking we wanted just to have presentations from both of our panelists just to ground ourselves in each of their respective practices. We have the Q&A portal open. So if you have more questions for either panelist, please feel free to use that. Um, we're not trying to pay lip service or have anyone flummoxed. Um, we are doing the best we can with what we have. So I think one of the things I was thinking about while each of y'all were talking was this fight to be seen and what that means. Um, and thinking, especially as Raquel noted about the humility around that. Um, and I wonder, you know, to Naima, especially in terms of being um, an image maker, if you could talk a little bit about, cause you were, when you started your presentation you were talking about a sensitivity around location and thinking about what it meant to answer an invitation to document a space that so many are mourning. Um, on really a global level. What does it mean to encounter with your subjects? How do you approach that, that conversation, that dialogue? And then maybe some of what happens on the back end with those images, um, I think might be interesting to hear about. Yeah, absolutely. I think for me, making an image is a trust exercise. It's a care exercise. It's, I'm, I would say in the last five to six years, I've photographed probably 80% of the people I'm meeting for the first time. So what does it mean to meet someone and photograph them in your first encounter? You have to establish trust really, really quickly. And I think that for me, that involves doing a lot of listening. That means um, creating, if I'm on set or even if I'm just outside in the natural landscape, it means thinking really pointedly about what those environments look like and what they feel like and, ha and asking people if they're comfortable um, but really being thoughtful about the set design like for Pursuit for example I worked with Jesse Levendoff who is the, a set designer and a, a, a filmmaker and a multi everything she's so talented but when we talked about the set I really wanted it to be to feel something like an extension of a home or my home and so 
what happens when I invite people into my house? I offer, I want them to sit down. I want them to take off your coat. I want, here's tea, here's water. Like thinking about the making of an image to, can hold all of that too. Um, because if someone doesn't trust you, you're not really going to be able, or I feel like I'm not going to be able to see them in the ways that I want to. Um, and in the ways that I, I hope that people want to see themselves, which for some is not how they're always used to seeing themselves. But I think I've had uh, many people over the years come back to me and say, oh, I was so sad in this image and I didn't like that you saw that, but now I'm coming back to it three years later and I really appreciate how you were able to see through some of the things that I thought I had put up. Um, so I think that, yeah, really being thoughtful from from start to finish and and doing your best and it's definitely not perfect and um the process can be very slow and messy especially as one person trying to make who has made probably over ten thousand images just like okay how how quickly can you move in this process and i think recently especially in my personal work it's likely that it's more slowly than people are used to or comfortable with but then I think there, there is a grace that's extended on either end and just knowing that there is work being done, it just might happen at a different pace and that's okay. And that's something that I'm also learning to become more okay with too. Thank you for sharing that Naima. And I, I love hearing about your practice as being adjacent to care and so rooted in care. And I think anybody who's had the privilege of stepping into your studio, your studio space, or even engaging with your work, that, that care is just so apparent. And um, it's making me think a lot about even Raquel's work too, which I think is rooted in a care, a care about, um, yeah, a care about longevity and sustainability and a care about stories. And I think, I'm interested in, in chatting more about that as well too, because there's so much in Black Futures that or it originated from a place of care. I mean, whether it was the care that formed the basis of Kimberly and I's relationship, you know, we're always in, in contact and in touch and talking about, you know, how's your heart today? How's your mental space today? You know, how are you feeling? How are you, you know, does working on the book sound like a good idea today? And sometimes it's not. Sometimes we would order food and sit on my stoop and drink wine and not work, um, which always cracks me up to say because our publisher or publicity team were always on these calls or in these talks. And so they know why things were delayed sometimes. But, um, but I do think, especially as Black people and Black queer people, you know, operating from that basis and not necessarily a space of productivity or final product or being motivated by capitalism. I mean, those, those are the things that ultimately drain us and don't sustain us. And so it's really nourishing to hear about how people frame their larger practices and, and um, their work, you know, in this backdrop of care. And so I don't know if that's bringing up anything for Raquel that you'd like to speak to or Naima, you have anything else you wanna say on it, but I'd love to hear more about that as kind of a, a grounding place to then radiate outwards from. Yeah, um, care. Yeah, I mean, I feel like, um, I feel like all of my work comes from some place of care and like empathy. Um, whether it's like for my younger self or past generations or car obviously current generations. Um, right. So right now in my book, um, I'm, I'm working on um, kind of the origins of like my activism. Um, and I, I put activism in quotes because it's what it's like one of those labels that is kind of put onto you in general before you actually like hold up that mantle for yourself. I think for a lot of folks, that's true. Um, and when I started doing my work and speaking up about 
my experience as a Black trans woman in the South and what was happening on the ground in Atlanta um, in the first iteration of the movement for Black Lives from a queer and trans perspective. Um, it, it didn't necessarily start as like activism. It just started as like, this is what needed to happen. Like nobody is paying attention to all of the blood, sweat and tears that this group of folks are um, putting into this movement. Uh, and still are, right? Um, and so it, it, I, I think for me, the care comes from so many different things, but the, the activism piece comes from wanting things to be different for the next people coming up. Um, you know, even though we're in a time where there's more like visibility than ever or more access than ever um it's not that great of a time in general i mean there's just so much stuff happening that you you would hope wouldn't still be happening so many kind of uh um stifled conversations on systems of oppression you know white supremacy is in some ways more um flagrant than ever before you know there's there's just so much going on and I think that's where the care comes from um I think more kind of specifically for me in wanting to bridge the activism in the media it came from there was a young trans teen who committed suicide in uh 2014 Leela Alcorn and I remember because she had this uh, suicide letter that was set to publish on her Tumblr. So she like set it to publish before obviously the act had uh, occurred. And I remember reading news about it and then I read the letter. And one of the things she said was that um, she just didn't see a future for herself. And she wanted her um, death to be a lesson. You know, she wanted it to like push people, push society to be better, to get its stuff together. And, you know, that was a powerful moment for me in kind of understanding like, I can't be in the closet because I have been in the closet for the first part of my like, journalism career, you know, at least the first year. Uh, I'm not that old, but the first year. And um, it, that kind of shattered this idea that um, being invisible, quote unquote, just wasn't enough. Like I needed to take the risk to be a, at least a little bit more visible with whatever little fragmented platform I had then. Um, and so that has really stuck with me and, and been one of those stories, one of those voices that has pushed me um, to care. Thank you so much for that. Um, oh, yes. I, I have so many words in my head and um, for the sake of brevity, because we are, we only have a few, a bit more time which is wild the internet is so weird um and we have some really brilliant questions from our guests which we'll go to next um but just a final question for the group um jenna feel free to chime in um i've been thinking a lot about care and the insistence in our language and in our maybe kind of structures around self-care and i wonder um, about the relationship between self-care, pleasure, and how we want ourselves to be seen, just to put a bow on this conversation around visibility. Um, and I wonder um, for each of you in, in your own way, um, if maybe you could talk about how you want to be seen, especially thinking about that letter, that powerful letter, and how you want to be remembered, um, how you want your future to look maybe sorry my brain is just doing a lot of things but um i think we've all shown up and adorned ourselves in these very specific ways as well 
And I wonder if we could maybe talk briefly before going to audience questions about pleasure. And I'm realizing as I'm talking, this is the most Leo question ever, but um, if we could talk about pleasure and visibility and representation um, and how we see ourselves before we go to audience questions, I would really appreciate that. I can jump in to give Naeem and Raquel a minute and a break. Y'all been doing a lot of heavy lifting. Um, Kimberly, I really appreciate that question and I, and I love your brain. So thank you for letting it just unfurl and all the brilliance come forth because that's such an interesting question. I think, especially on the tale of, of Raquel Sherry and that really moving anecdote, you know, and, and not to undermine, like not for nothing, like, you know, it does, matter and I, I think we've all all been on the receiving end of, of messages from young people and older people who are just like seeing you embody whatever you embody and the the freeness that they perceive does mean something to people even if they don't feel they can express it yet I mean I've, I've just received a lot of feedback like that in the course of my career from people who do feel like the risks we take and the courage you know the courage we walk in every day even though at this point in our lives it may not feel that courageous you know for some people out there who don't have access and don't live in a coastal city it, it means a lot and i think um me personally now i'm going to be a very jenna you know space and say i'm working really hard to detach from my perception of self and detach from needing it to to be read a certain way and leaning more into what is the most honest and true and real and free iteration of this self in this realm? And so <laughs> that's what I'm working on. And so I think um, the, you know, it's interesting because there was a question a few questions ago about, oh my gosh, about, in my mind, I'm remembering it as legacy, but it wasn't necessarily around that, but it was anyway, it was just thinking about this idea of like, you know, why we do the work that we do. And I, and I really do think of the book that we made as a portal, right? As a portal of possibilities of just showing, um, oh, it was about thinking about representation. You know, I, I didn't want to make this book because there was a lack. It didn't come from a place of, you know, you know, elbowing our, our way to, to a seat at the table or even a, a room in the boardroom or whatever. It was more like, you know, I want to stand arm in arm with a legacy of, people like Toni Morrison and Todi K. Babara and, and Claudia Tate and all the people that we reference in the acknowledgements that we were trying to come up afterwards and the people that inspired us, Thelma Golden. You know, I wanted to really be in that, I don't know, I wanted to sit at that communal, I wanted to break that communal bread. And that felt, that felt like the challenge I wanted to rise to. Um, at that point in time. And I think it also was for thinking about how influential those books were to me and thinking about the possibilities of somebody stumbling across this book. And, you know, anyone who's read an interview with Kimberly and I lately or listened to us recently knows that, you know, when we first came together, I was thinking really small for the book. I was thinking, oh, it should be a zine or like a like a Tumblr or some ephemeral one-off thing. And it was really Kimberly's genius and, and prescience that said like, no, this needs to be a book because of accessibility and technology and libraries and, and who knows how far this thing can travel. And we want it to be a gem that our younger selves would have stumbled upon in some auntie's living room, you know, and, and secreted away and then just explored and had this whole uh, experience with. And so I don't know, I think that there's something. So I'm, I guess what I'm trying to say is that I'm thinking about that less for myself because I'm, I'm really working on having sort of a very loving relationship with myself that is very steeped in pleasure and glamour, but it's just for me. It's not necessarily for people to see. But the thing I do want them to see though is the possibility that I think a book like this can entail and the way that it hopefully kind of leads into a warrant of other possibilities for what it means to think about um, all of our lives as worthy of recording and documenting and preserving and putting into a beautiful time capsule, um, however that may, however that may end up working out. Um, even if it's just starting a letter writing project with yourself or with a friend, which we talk about in the book. So um, I don't know if that's, I feel like I got close to, to answering your question, but I really love that question because it's just, it's just endless. And I think that's a really beautiful, a beautiful prompt. So thank you for that. I'll jump in. Um... I love this question too, because it's one that I am thinking about often. And 
I used to be a middle and high school teacher. So I very much thinking about like the ways that we show up and present ourselves. Like I was very aware of how I moved, especially as a black woman working in prep schools with people who were, you know, the age of my grandparents. So people already thought, you know, I had all these things stacked against me, like, oh, are you a student or oh, or blah, blah, blah. So I feel like I had to overcompensate. I did overcompensate in some ways of like, oh, well, let me look this way so that it's easier for you to digest me. And I think that recently we're talking about, if Jenna was talking about detachment, like thinking about recognizing that I am constantly moving away from who that person was. And e that even shows up in my work as well. It, it's like, wasn't until maybe three years ago that I started including myself in my work. And if you go to Fotografiska, there are like, they're small, but there are probably like six or seven nudes of me in there. And there are ways that I would have never shown myself or my body before. And now it feels like, yeah, that happened. You see it, whatever. Like it doesn't, it doesn't mean it doesn't have to place any judgment on my character, on my personhood. And I think that pleasure is so much about the work that I am interested in making and also the environments that I'm interested in being in and the way that I'm trying to live right now, especially in 2020 and in COVID and in quarantine. It's like I, in the past six months, even though they've been really difficult, I have experienced joy daily. And I think that it's because it's an act of, it's a choice. It's also who I'm surrounded by. Um, but really thinking about, we have to, I have to value my life and my joy and my pleasure. And I have to center it because no one else is going to do that for me. So that's where I'm at. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Naima and Jenna. Jeez. Um, yeah, I, you know, I don't know if I ever have enough, I never feel like I have enough words um, to kind of like make sense of my own like sense of self. Um, yeah, you know, I, I think that um, I'm like constantly trying to do the homework of like releasing myself from society's like trappings. And I mean, that's ongoing work, right? Like it's like you, you drop some of them. Clearly I've dropped plenty of them throughout the course of my life. And you know, I have picked up other ones, right? And so it's like, it's, con it's just constant. Um, work, I think, trying to like uncover that like authenticity, uncover that like vulnerability. Um, but I will say I, I shed more and more of these like ideas of like martyrdom. I think that we put on in social justice spaces. Um, I learn more and more through great friendships, including some on this call, that um, pleasure is important, you know, and pleasure is radical. Um, and so it's it's work for me because I'm a, you know, y'all know I'm a workaholic, honey. Like, it's always like something, right? Like, I feel like I have to be in motion, be productive, doing something. Um, but I, I value more and more rest and restoration as I grow and learn and get older. So that's kind of where I am with the, I think the sense of self, right? It's just like shedding the, the workaholic ideas that um, I've put on in a white supremacist capitalist society and all the other things that I don't feel like naming because that's work too. So I'm being oppressed by Zoom. Um, thank you so much for sharing that, Raquel. And I think so much of it is an iterative process. I think, you know, just to answer the question myself very briefly, um, and we'll go into audience questions. I also know that we're coming up in an hour. So if anybody needs to drop off, this is Zoom. 
and we appreciate you for being here and we don't want to hold you all night um, but we do have some really good questions from the audience which will popcorn back and forth um, but for me I spent so much of this week literally just like looking at myself in the mirror and rubbing as much like makeup on as I could in this really beautiful gesture um, and dancing a lot and sitting with myself and you guys can't smell me right now because it's Zoom, but like it's very natural over here. Um, sitting with all of that and all the juices is really important to me. Um, and I think I see a lot of pleasure and I feel a lot of pleasure in that um, because I think, yeah, for many reasons, I think our beauty especially is expected to be this very public gesture or our self-regard is expected to be this very public gesture. I think Instagram and other platforms like that make it seem like, oh, if you get the proper light or you look good, you have to document it for others. And I've been trying to sit with what it means to set up, I mean, Jenna knows this all too well. She knows my personal praxis of the self timer. Um, and just, you know, sometimes they get posted, sometimes they don't. Like for everyone that ends up online, there's 50 others. Um, but at any rate, we will pivot now to audience questions. Thank you all for your incredible attention and comments and questions. Um, and of course, to our interpreters and to our captioner for um, making this event more accessible to all of us. Um, do you, Jenna, do you want me to read the first question or do you want to read the first question? Feel free to dive in babes and then I'll, I'll do the next one. Okay, cute. Um, let's see, I love this, we got some pick. Um, Ooh, okay. I'll ask a book question. This is for um, for Jenna, um, I guess, and I can answer it too. From Dylan, what led you to want to create a mixed media book with text, images, and glossy pages? Ooh, thank you for that question, Dylan. I mean, look at us. We are glossy. We are multimedia. We are hypervisual and hypertextual. So the book had to be that way. Um, it emerged really naturally, you know, in my recollection. I think that when we first came together and started talking about what would become this book, you know, we, it's worth noting too, and this is for anyone who's working on a project and, you know, just like a little BTS about it. I mean, it took us five years to pull this together. So I just want to say that because I think in our, our sort of like hyper sped up Instagram economy, it just feels like somebody mentions a thing and then it comes out and it's like, no, no, no. There was so much labor that went into this book over like a time lapse period of time. Um, and when we started figuring out what was going to be in the book, you know, the first list of names and ideas, I mean, a lot of them actually didn't make it into the into the project because it kept evolving. And I think, you know, we were interested in essays, we were interested in, in conversations, we were interested in these kind of social media archives. And so from then on, and we, and we obviously knew there would be works by artists and images. So at that point, it just became really clear, okay, well, this is a really multifaceted book. So how how much deeper can we go? I mean, there was a point in time we were trying to get part of the book rendered in Braille. Like that was really important to us. And we kept bringing it up in production meetings and people were like, this is gonna be really expensive and take a lot of time. And we don't know if we can do it. And we'd be like, yes, but can you do it though? You know, um, we always knew that we wanted it to be just one of the most dynamic things on a shelf. But also I think it speaks to the works that we were drawn to as well. Like I'm, I'm such a visual person. You know, we're both writers, but we're both, we love, you know, an, an image is text as well. And I think that gets lost sometimes in our culture because we are kind of swiping past things so quickly. But, you know, in the, in the composition, I mean, it tells a story as well. And so um, it was, it just emerged very naturally. Would you say that's right, Kimberly? Yeah, uh, 100%. I mean, I, I think so much, you know, just to, to relate to this conversation, especially of um, sitting with my partner and looking at the pursuit deck and going through and being like, I know this person for this person and this person for this reason and this person for this reason. And I slept with this person back in 2013. And <laughs> I think being able to have a text that could be really multifaceted was really important for us um, because I think that the more diversity, like real diversity that exists in a text, the more opportunities for entry there are. 
um, my past life was doing social media. And I think for me, I always thought about each tweet or Instagram post or Pinterest pin, whatever, as an opportunity for engagement. It was just another door into the institution that I was working for. And so I think when we decided to put together this book, it was really about, okay, maybe this kind of signal might respond to a particular audience, or maybe someone does really want to read something heavy with legitimately two pages of footnotes, um, but they can sit beside each other in as non-hierarchical of a way as possible um, was also really important. Like the BTS on the emails that I've sent to people <laughs> on the like, do this, don't do this, do that, but don't do that um, is a whole other expose. But um, I think for us, we were trying to take as much agency as we could to make sure that it could be a really ripe final product. Gushy, gushy. Juice, juice. Um, okay, there's a great question in here that's for all the panelists that says from Thomas, um, outside of each other's recent work, can the panelists discuss any recent item across any medium that has inspired them or made them rethink their own work? So just any recent item that's been inspiring or caused us to rethink our own work. I'm gonna jump on that because I went to a museum today and I've been having such a hard time just like leaving the house. And I saw um, Colleen Smith has three, um, three projects at the Whitney right now. And her work is so, oh, actually more than three, but three that are standing out to me right now that are so stunning. Um, but there is one video called Sir Joyner and I sat in the gallery and watched it four times. And I'm not a big video person at, mu at museums. And I sat and I watched it four times because it was so soothing. And I think that that's really what I want and need right now. It's like, I wanna fill my world with things that are soothing because all of the harshness and the hardness of life, I that comes far too easy. Um, and even, from ourselves. Raquel was talking about being a workaholic. I think all four of us are, are guilty of that. Um, and so it's so easy to, to work. <laughs> it's so easy to work. It's so easy to throw myself into work. And so to, on a Monday say, actually, today is supposed to be my day off. I'm actually going to go to a museum and take a day off. Um, feels really important and urgent. So Colleen Smith. I'll go. Um, that has made me think differently about my work. Um, I don't. I don't know about that piece, but I will say I think um, this might be a little like left field, which is never a bad thing. But um, the D, the DJ, the young like DJ guy who's like going viral again, amorphous, who makes these amazing kind of mashups of like songs from like different pop artists and different times or whatever. He's just like getting a lot of love on Twitter these days. And that has just been like really feeling for me because I've been following him for like, somebody was like, they've been on the SoundCloud this weekend. He's so good. No, he really is. But I've seen that like come up because I we started following each other like years ago when he was like really young and so it's just beautiful to see um him stick with it and get that payoff in this moment it just it feels beautiful and i think it's just a testament to like keeping that keeping it going you know keep doing your passion and sticking with it Okay, I can go. Um, there are so many things that are inspiring me and, and can give, you know, getting me to rethink my work. But um, I recently watched the second episode of Small Acts, Steve McQueen's new series on, I guess it's Amazon. And the episode is called Lover's Rock. I highly recommend it. It is very, very, very low stress. There are a couple of moments of, of moderate stress embedded within it, but they're minimal. Um, 
you know, depending on your experience, but um, there's a couple of scenes um, in this episode, which really just focus on a bunch of young uh, West Indian British folks in the late, it's not clear, but it feels like it's the late seventies, uh, maybe even early eighties or probably late seventies at a house party. And there are just so many scenes in this short film, essentially, where people are dancing and having looks and leaning up against a wall and just moving around this pretty small contained space, which is just the floor of, of, a, of a living room where this party is happening. And I have secret ambitions to make short films. Um, it's so funny to think about the ways in which we all have worked together and collaborated because Naeem is in the only short film I've ever made. <laughs> um, but it's, you know, it just really inspired me and it moved me because there's not a lot of dialogue happening and it's just these incredibly beautiful young people. Just, and I just remember that feeling of, you know, an entire universe can happen one night on a dance floor. And there is this close up of the walls sweating at some point. And I re just remember that so viscerally from my youth. And I've been thinking a lot about, I mean, it's so me that several people have just texted me that image of the wall sweating in this film. And it makes me think a lot about how much, how much, of course, so much labor went into constructing that, that, that scene and that entire film, but it feels really effortless. And I think thinking a lot about like simplicity and stripping things away and make, you know, less dialogue, less, it's just, it's just so simple. And so much emotion is transmuted through that. And so it's been making me really think about um, how to do more with less, you know, in my own creative practice. Thank you for that, Jenna. I love that too. Um, I was sorry, I was like multitasking because we had this really great question that I answered privately um, from Camilo that was about the representation of um, black dance and performance. And um, in the book, we have a beautiful essay by Jasmine Johnson, who is a scholar of dance and a dancer and wrote about the hashtag optimistic challenge that went viral. Um, and then also um, we have Alice Shepard, who is an incredible dancer um, from the Kinetic Light Dance Theater, who everyone should check out. And then there's nods to Fairview and Slave Play in the book. Um, and I mentioned all of that to also answer this first question. Um, I was watching today, one of my dear hearts, Jerron Harmon was doing a takeover on Instagram Live. And I just love Jerron with my whole entire heart. And I really, I was gonna say envy, but I guess emulate and hope to achieve the tenderness and sweetness that Jerron brings to both intimate and I guess all intimate. I think Jerron's a very intimate person. I, I hope you wouldn't mind me saying that. Um, but in private and public spaces, but we stand around in this house. And I think that I wanna gauge from everyone how everyone's feeling. Like, I think maybe we could ask one more, but I don't wanna hold everyone. I know we're at the end of a very long day. Yeah, leave meeting if it's too much. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, <laughs> One more. Um, okay. Boop, 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 boop. Uh, let's see. Okay, I like this question and anyone who wants to answer it, feel free to answer it, but no pressure because it is a difficult-ish one. We have a question that says, how do you see care expanding from the personal into the public domain? And I can answer if y'all want a little bit more time, but I think a lot about, um, like I have a personal vendetta against self-care as a thing and often talk to my therapist about it um, because I think that self-care kind of implies this solitude and the siloing that I find to be really rooted in ableism and rooted in capitalism and rooted in um, systems that are the antithesis to care and perhaps why we need more care. And I think that care in public is, um, is vulnerability, is making space for others, is, um, is thinking about 
the architecture of our world that makes it such that so many are marginalized. Um, and I don't think that I can't think of like specific strat strategic answers, but I think for me, it's really about us all taking on an agency around making this world a more accessible one to others. Um, and thinking about the fact that you don't have to do all these acts alone and that the, the acts that you share can also be an education to others. Um, I think I can speak for myself personally in this five year process that Jen and I have been in and creating this book. I've learned so very much about what it means to take care of myself in new and profound ways. Um, and I think that it's important for us to allow ourselves that learning because there is a strange impetus put on this like acute knowledge about care that is also kind of unfair and makes me feel like not a real adult sometimes, so. Yeah, I mean, I feel like none of us arrive and have it all together at once, you know? So I think, I, I keep saying care in public and I think that Kimberly, something you said sparked in me that it it is such small acts and gestures. It can be something as small as like acknowledging someone that you don't, that is off, might often be overlooked, like saying thank you to a, a bus driver or saying hello to um, a security guard at the museum or thanking the person who takes out the trash, like you're super, I don't know. But I think that it starts in really small ways and just recognizing other people. But I also think that again, it takes, I mean, it takes a village is such a, I, I feel like my mom when I say that, but it's so true. It's like, I would not have gotten through so many things without the people in my life, without my friends, without my community, without my partners. Like, um, I think care in public looks like the black herbalists who are really showing up and out right now. Suhaili of Moon Mother Apothecary is in the chat right now. Arvelin of Goldfeather, um, Karen Rose of Sacred Vise Apothecary. All three of them have held me down for years before I even knew like what it meant to really work with medicine. They were like, try this or, you know, I'd go to acupuncture and someone would give me a tincture. And I, I didn't really fully know exactly what was happening, but to actually really think through the practice of using herbs and using plants as medicine and distributing those resources to people when they need them. There's been so many um, kind of free resources for Black people this year in terms of herbalism and how beautiful that is and why didn't that happen before. And, you know, people have been dying. We have been marching forever. So why, why is it now in this year that everything is, oh, I'm going to do a, a free giveaway or whatever. But I think that that needs to extend beyond the moments when we're in the streets, outrage, when we're fighting for our lives, when there's all this public grief because we're already going through so much. Um, so I want more to care in public. I guess what I want is more, um, more of that all the time and not just from my people. You're here. I second that Naima and I'm in agreement with everything you've shared and everything that Kimberly has shared. And I actually really love this question about how care, you know, travels from the personal into, I guess, the public um, and how it spirals upwards and outwards, because you're both right. It completely starts with the self. And I think, you know, I'm someone who I've spent so much time trying to figure out how to replace self-care in my lexicon because it has been co-opted and coerced and totally, you know, mutated beyond its its origin story. Um, and when Audre Lorde first spoke those words, I mean, it, it really was about, you know, she she's started talking about self-care in response to dealing with the cancer diagnosis and and really realizing that fighting and advocating for her care, you know, that the medical system was not on her side and it's really interesting to think about how that, you know, I overheard someone once ages ago when I was riding the subway being like, I'm going to binge on pizza and have Netflix tonight, hashtag self-care. And I'm like, you know, I guess that counts, but it's just interesting because it really did have this, this political praxis and this orientation around the need for black people to be able to care for themselves, you know? Um, 
but I am coming to a place where I think for me, it's a daily practice. It's a personal practice. It starts with me and it starts with me being kind to myself and allowing myself gentleness and space and an extra 10 minutes in bed if that's what I need and to turn off my phone and go for a walk if that's what I need and not really feeling guilty or shameful about it because, um, you know, there'll always be more work to do and urgency and productivity. But if I, if I'm not caring for myself, then it makes it a lot harder for me to reach out in a gentle way to talk to Naima about her presentation for tonight or, you know, check in with Raquel about tonight. I mean, it's just really easy to disregard that care for others if you're not practicing it for yourself first and foremost. And it can look so many ways. I mean, that's the incredible thing about care is that, um, it's totally personal and private and we all get to figure out what it looks like for us and start with an origin place. Um, and it literally could just be taking an extra minute in the bath or the shower, you know, and, and I always think about that too, again, going back to simplicity and, and it's not necessarily the, you know, Instagram and Pinterest and all these platforms will have you believe that you're not caring for yourself properly. If you're not making an elaborate three tiered cake on your day off and photographing it, you know, it can look, so many ways. So um, that's my answer to that question. <laughs> that was beautiful. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I think that self-care is so, um, it's a creative endeavor, you know, it's just like, or to me, organizing is a creative endeavor. Um, and I think self-care really is too, is something that um, it took me a long time to realize, but self-care for me is probably never going to be static. You know, I'm never going to have the definition that works that I'll rattle off that is the same six months from then, because I'm really not that great at habit forming. So I know that about myself. I have my seasons and my cycles where I have to redo all of it, right, and get back into a new habit. Um, yeah, so so that's one thing I think it it all it changes often and that's okay. I think the other thing for me for a long time I was saying um, my sisters are my self care um, or my siblings are my self care and you know the feeling that I get when I'm like connecting with my people. I will never be able to feel that alone. That is a very unique experience and example of self-care for me. Um, just like the moments where I'm completely in bliss being in solitude, you know, not being worried about what I should be responding to on social media or whatever. But again, that is very specific and there is a space for that to also be under this umbrella of self-care. So I embrace the messiness. I embrace that it is not static. Um, and I also embrace that self-care doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be alone. So, yeah. Well, Jenna, we're coming up at the end of this event. No, it's so hard to say goodbye. Oh my gosh, we could really do this all night. I wish that everyone could have insight into when Jenna and I talk on the phone and we're both just like lingering, <laughs> like you're gonna hang up. Um, many, many, many thanks to all of you, all 200 plus of you who have spent your evening with us. Um, some repeat offenders from other events. We will have more events if you'd like to join us with a whole host of other guests and representing different organizations, many black owned, many uh, women owned businesses, um, are coming together to power this whole book tour thing. Um, many, many thanks to Shannon and Shante, our interpreters, and Bobby on captioning, the entire team at BAM, volunteers included. Um, so many organizations have been so hit by this, this, this pandemic, and we really appreciate BAM um, holding space for this project that we are so proud of. Um, yeah. Yeah. Just thank you all for the, the care and the love and support. And we really are operating in a totally unprecedented paradigm. And it's so bizarre to be doing things this way. And yet 
it has felt so gentle and so supported and so sweet. And a special thank you to everyone who bought tickets for tonight because a portion of the money for the tickets does go to help this food pantry, which we mentioned in the beginning of the episode, the episode, <laughs> the beginning of tonight's event. And um, very still processing moment there. Um, but food insecurity is an issue that's really near and dear to Kimberly and I's lot, our, our hearts. And so we really appreciate the care that went into that for tonight. And yeah, thank you to all the hands behind the scenes as well that put this this event together. We would not be here without you all. And just a big heartfelt thank you. It's it's like so emotionally expensive to ask anyone to do anything these days. And everyone has just met us with so much generosity and it's just, it's just been such a lesson in reciprocity. So many, many thanks and we love you all. And we're still on tour for another week. So come say hi. I put the link to the other events in the chat and we love you all so much. Yes, and thank you, Naima and Raquel. I'm not sure if we said that, but just again to echo it, no. y'all are the OGs, a part of our care network, a part of this book, of course, but an even more important part of our lives. Naima took the first pictures of us as a duo. Yes. Riding with us through all of this. Raquel has put up with us in many group chats, talking over and over again about this fucking book. And so <laughs> thank you both so very much for being here with us in this way. It is a treat and an honor to know you both. Love you so much. Thank you for making this book. All right, we go log out now. Y'all take Bye, care. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.